There is nothing save the selfish heart of man that lives unto itself. No bird that cleaves the air, no animal that moves upon the ground, but ministers to some other life. There is no leaf of the forest or lowly blade of grass but has its ministry. Every tree and shrub and leaf pours forth that element of life without which neither man nor animal could live. And man and animal in turn minister to the life of tree and shrub and leaf. The flowers breathe fragrance and unfold their beauty in blessing to the world. The sun sheds its light to gladden a thousand worlds. The ocean, itself the source of all our springs and fountains, receives the streams from every land, but takes to give. The mists ascending from its bosom fall in showers to water the earth, that it may bring forth and bud. The Desire of Ages, page 20, paragraph 2. And the simple message of that quotation is this. Everything created by God was created to serve something else. Nothing was created for its own sake. Sin introduced that into the heart of man. But creation's purpose, every leaf, every blade of grass exists to serve something else. That's why Christ came and he said, I came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. Only the presence of Christ in the heart of a person can empower that person to live that kind of life. Good evening, everyone. It is very nice to see you. Time is winding down. Today is August 27. We have two days left, tomorrow and Sabbath, and it will be all over. But we thank God for having brought us this far. And I'm particularly grateful to him for the constancy and the steadfastness with which you have attended these meetings, whether in person or online or wherever you are. It is my prayer from my heart that God will bless your life and that the things you've heard and learned and received will create a change in your life that will last until Jesus comes to take you home. And I thank God again publicly for the high honor of being the one called by him to speak for him, and I'll try to do the best I can tonight with the subject, all classes have exams. What did I say? All classes have exams. Let me welcome those on the internet, YouTube, and Facebook, wherever you are, in whatever country from which you are watching. God bless you. Thanks again for being with us. We sense your presence by faith, even though we cannot see you. I would like to thank the pastor, I haven't done that publicly, for inviting me to occupy this sacred desk for this period of time. Pastor Mokua, may the Lord eternally bless him, his family, and his ministry. I'm particularly grateful to the family where I'm staying, the Mokaya family. Sweet, lovely, gracious, friendly, giving. God bless them all the days of their lives. It's a perfect environment for me, nice and quiet, and I cannot thank God enough. They are now my people. And so I'm grateful to God for everything. Let me thank the young ladies who sing so beautifully. May the Lord bless you, and may you always sing for the glory of God. And for the two ladies who sang the first week, one sang just before I spoke, and this week another lady sang, God bless them. If you have a talent, whatever it is, commit it to God and you will suffer no eternal loss. Commit it to God and you will not suffer an eternal loss. Our subject again, all classes have exams. I always ask you, and you've been very, very compliant, to make sure these does not, do not ring and so far not one phone has rung during these meetings. I'm grateful to you for being so cooperative and I'm sure God is pleased with your sense of reverence. The second favor I ask is that you pray for me while I'm speaking. Please ask God to put his words in my mouth. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words 
in thy mouth, and I earnestly desire to speak the words of God. And the third favor I will always ask as long as I stand in a pulpit, think. A lot of people sit in churches, they never think. That's why they stay in the churches. But if people would think as they listen to God's word, they may ask themselves, why am I in this church? What am I doing? Isaiah 1, 18, come now. Let us reason together, saith the Lord. Those are my three favors I have asked of you. Let's bow our heads now and pray. Dear God, we're alive by your mercy, your love, your power. Our senses work by your power. We have physical mobility by your power. Thank you for that, dear God. We still enjoy religious freedom because you, by your power, have restrained those who would seek to restrict our freedom. As we bow before you, dear God, if we've sinned against you today, forgive us. Cleanse us, dear Father, in that stream flowing from Calvary. Make us clean and fill us with your spirit that the Spirit may enable us to understand the message that is delivered. For me, I humble myself before you, I truly do. And I ask you, dear God, to put your Spirit in this six feet, 200 pounds of dirt and clay, that what I say may truly come from you, because dirt cannot possibly declare truth. Father, surround this place with angels that we may worship in safety. Bless your beloved people all over the globe. Wherever they are watching their God, let your spirit be present. And bless them, bless their families. Bless the countries where they are. Bless the leaders, their God. Guide their minds, their thinking, and their deliberations. Now, their Father, we commit this service to your glory. Receive our worship and grant us your blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All classes have exams. Let us go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We'll read verse 10. It's 10 minutes after 7 precisely. I'll try to release you by 8 o'clock or before. 2 Corinthians 5, reading verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he have done, whether it be good or bad. We're told we must all, in some form or fashion, appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Let us go to Romans chapter 14. Romans 14. Let's read verse 10 and verse 12. Romans 14, our subject, all classes have exams. But why dost thou judge thy brother? And why dost thou set at not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Verse 10, so that every one of us shall give an account of himself before God. The Bible tells us that there is a reckoning in the life of every person. Let me repeat, there is a day of reckoning in the life of every human being from Adam until now. There are some people who live their lives as if they will never have to give an account for the kind of lives they have led. We may escape earthly authorities. We may never appear before earthly judges, but we must all of us somehow, in some way, stand before the judge of the universe and give an account for the life we have lived. That's the exam. Do we pass it or do we fail it? You see, life is the class we're in, the class of life. The teacher, if we will uh, follow God's recommendation, is the word of God. Or the textbook is the word of God. The teacher is the spirit of God representing Jesus Christ. The teaching assistants are preachers and Bible workers. The exam is the judgment. The classroom is the world. The students are we. A day is coming when all of us must account to God 
for the lives we have led, the lives we have led. Having said that, let us go <clears throat> to 1 Corinthians 15. We'll read from verse 51. No, before we go there, let's go to an earlier passage. Let's go to Luke 20, and we'll read from verse 34. Of Luke 20, our subject, all classes have exams. Now, you really have to think as we look at this passage from the Bible. Luke 20, verse 34. He answered and said unto them, The children of this world marry and are given in marriage. But they that shall be counted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead neither marry or are given in marriage, neither can they die any more, for they are equal unto the angels, being, being the children of God, because they are the children of the resurrection. Now, Jesus says, the children of this world marry and are given in marriage. What he means is, human beings on earth, from Adam until now, we marry, we give in marriage, that's part of normal life. Then he says something interesting. But they that shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world. In other words, we have now two worlds that Jesus mentioned. The children of this world marry and are given in marriage. But they that shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world. Let's think. This world is this life. That world is is the life to come which Christ himself shall establish. When he destroys sin and sinners, makes the world brand new, and that's where the redeemed, those who have followed Christ, will live forever on this brand new earth. Let me read the passage again. The children of this world marry and are given in marriage, but they that shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage now what does the bible mean by those those that shall be counted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead let's see what happens when people rise from the dead Let's go now to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51. Jesus already said that people must be accounted worthy, and we know the other side, also accounted unworthy. They will obtain the world to come, those who are counted worthy. So there must be a process that determines who is worthy. 1 Corinthians 15 Let's read from verse 51, our subject, all classes of exams. I pray again, Holy Father, help me to be careful and to listen to your spirit as he speaks to me in Jesus' name. Amen. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised now. Paul is saying, there will be an instant change at the resurrection. Instant, he describes it, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. Why is it that this change is necessary? Listen to the words again. Behold, I show you a mystery, we shall not all sleep. Meaning, when Christ comes, there will be some living righteous and of course some dead righteous. So when he says, we shall not all sleep, he means we won't all be dead by the time Christ comes. There will be some children of God still alive. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed, whether we are alive when he comes or dead. We shall all be changed in a moment. If that's too long, he says, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised. How? How? And we shall all be changed. For this corruptible must do what? Put on incorruptible. Come on. And this mortal must put on immortality. How long does it take? The twinkling of an eye. 
Well, let's, let's think. If that change, let, let's go back to verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised. How? Incorruptible. Now, picture this. Here's Christ. He has come. Here's a dead person who died in Christ. The person comes out of the grave changed. The person does not come out and is then changed. The person is changed in the grave and comes out of the grave changed. There is a reason for that, and the reason is biblical, but let me repeat. When you read the Bible, I've told you before, read it microscopically. The dead shall be raised incorruptible. Why is that necessary? Go to Hebrews 12. Let's read verse 29. Our subject, all classes have exams. 20 minutes after 7. Listen to Hebrews 12, 29. Do you have that? For our God is what? A consuming fire. The very presence of God consumes. Consumes sin. Consumes sinners. Our God is a consuming fire. Go to Exodus 24. Listen to how the presence of God on Mount Sinai is described by Moses. Exodus 24, verse 17. Second book of the Bible, Exodus 24, verse 17. And the sight of the glory of the Lord was as a consuming fire on the top of the mount in the sight of the children of Israel. So we have another verse. It says, and the sight of the glory of the Lord was as a consuming fire on the top of the mount in the sight of the children of Israel. Go to Psalm 50. Psalm 50, we'll read verse 3. Psalm 50, verse 3. The 50th Psalm, reading from verse 3. Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. By the way, those who preach the rapture, they say that people will be taken quietly. And Jesus, just quietly. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches Christ comes with a lot of sound and noise. Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour before him. And it shall be very tempestuous round about him. We have Hebrews 12, 29. Exodus 24, 17. Psalm 53 that tells us that God's presence is like a consuming fire. Now, Keeping this in mind, remember Moses in Exodus 33, verse 18, and he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And God told him in verse 20, there shall no man see my face and live. If you look at God in this present condition, you're consumed immediately. Because even though you're a child of God, you still have a carnal nature. Even though you're obeying God, you still possess a carnal nature. And the only way you and I can stand in the full glory of God's presence is when this mortal puts on immortality and this corruptible puts on incorruption. And so even the child of God cannot stand in the full blaze of God's glory. And so God told Moses, no one can see my face and live. Now keep this in mind as we go back and try to figure out why the dead are raised incorruptible. 1 Corinthians 15, reading from verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Now, if the dead righteous come up before they are changed from mortal to immortal, do you know what happens to them? They're consumed immediately because they cannot stand the glory of God. So God has to raise them in a changed condition so they can stand in his presence and not be consumed. So they are changed in the grave. Those alive, they are changed 
instantly. If that's clear, say amen. All right. Now, having said that, if I come from the grave, incorruptible, changed, a decision had been made before that that I should be made incorruptible. Are you following me? A decision must have been made before I died that I will come up from the grave incorruptible. Go to Revelation 14. Let's read verse 13. Revelation 14, verse 13. Revelation 14, verse 13. I heard a voice saying, right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yes, saith the spirit that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Blessed are the dead which die how? In the Lord. In other words, when you die in the Lord, you die blessed. Go to Revelation 20, let's read verse 5. Revelation 20, sorry, verse 6, not 5. Revelation 20, verse 6. You have that? Blessed is he that do what? Come on, blessed is he that hath part in what? The first resurrection. Now, Revelation 14, 13 says, you go down how? Blessed. Revelation 20, verse 6 says what? You come up how? Blessed. You go down in Christ. You come up in Christ. This time, immortal and incorruptible. A decision must be made before you die that you will have a part in this world. Let me say it again. A decision must have been made before the righteous die that they will be a part of that new world. Go back now to the words of Jesus Christ. Luke 20, reading from verse 34. Luke 20, reading from verse 34. He answered and said unto them, the children of this world marry and are given in marriage of this world. But they that shall be accounted worthy. That means judged or deemed or assessed or evaluated. And the conclusion is worthy. Listen carefully to this now. That activity is going on right now in heaven. Let me say differently and more pointedly. There is a judgment going on in heaven right now. And decisions are being made as to who is determined worthy to be a part of the world to come or unworthy. Go to Revelation chapter 3. Let's read verse 5. Revelation 3 verse 5, our subject. All classes have exams. Revelation 3, verse 5. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed with white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Now, Jesus is saying there's something called the book of life. And people's names are in that book book and can be taken out let me say it again there is a judgment going on in heaven now decisions are being made by a heavenly tribunal as to who will be worthy to be a part of that new world and who is not i preached a few nights ago about the beast of revelation 13 and who will follow him those who obey his Sabbath as opposed to God's Sabbath. Let's go to Revelation 13, read verse 7 again. We read it last, verse 8, but perhaps we did not read it as closely as we should. But it, is, it has significance for this evening's message. Revelation 13, 8, listen to who will be worshiping this man-made system that requires the worship of God's people or anyone. Revelation 13, 8, and all that dwell upon the earth. Now, when the Bible says all, it means except some. Are you following me? Except a few. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. Now, hear how they describe. Whose names are not written in the book of life 
of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. The Bible says those who follow a man-made system of worship will be those whose names are not in that book of life. Revelation 3 verse 5 says, He that overcometh. And there's only one thing to overcome. What's that? One word. Three letters. Sin. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. Hmm. My brothers and sisters, there is a judgment going on in heaven right now as we rush back and forth to work and to the football stadium and to the casino and to the bar and to the whorehouse and to wherever we go rushing back and forth in this life there is a judgment going on in heaven and decisions are being made about who will be worthy and who is not and we need to understand that every class all classes have exams let's go look a little closer at that judgment to see what the standard is go to ex not exodus ecclesiastes 12 let's read verse 13 and verse 14 ecclesiastes 12 13 and 14 let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter this is solomon the wisest man fear god and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing. Now Solomon is saying, listen, you better live obediently to God because one day there will be a judgment. And of course, the judgment will be based on God's standard of righteousness, his law, which people believe has been done away with. Listen to James. We read that yesterday. So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. Live as if you understand that one day in your life there will be an exam. Don't just rush around as though you are oblivious, and perhaps you did not know, oblivious to the fact that there is a process going on in heaven now. Now you know there are some people who are tried and deemed guilty or innocent in absentia. There are some people who commit crimes and they run away to another country and the place where the crime was committed, a trial is held and the person is condemned in absence because all the evidence is available. And then efforts are made to extradite the person back so the person can be in prison or hanged or whatever. There is a judgment going on in heaven now. Jesus is the intercessor. Notice Revelation 3, 5 again. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, representing Christ's righteousness. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. It is Christ who speaks for you in the judgment. Anything Christ says, the father accepts. Are you with me? Anything Christ says, the Father accepts. Anyone Christ defends, the Father accepts. Because the Father and Christ are one in heart and mind and everything. Two separate personalities, but one in spirit and purpose like husband and wife should be. Christ is the one interceding on our behalf. Who is our? Those who recognize our need for a savior, who seek his blood for cleansing, and who by his spirit seek to live a life that pleases him. Those who follow the counsel of James, in James 4 verse 7, resist the devil. But before that he says, submit yourselves to God. Whom does Christ intercede for? Those who follow the counsel of Peter, resist the devil, submit yourself to God. Between Peter and James, those who follow the counsel of Paul to Timothy, 1 uh, Timothy 6, 12, fight the good fight of faith. Those are the ones for whom Christ intercedes. And Jesus says, to those who overcome, I will not blot out his name, out meaning the name is in the book. Unfaithfulness leads to the name being removed. Let me pause. Think. Father, give me simple language, please. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen to Revelation 3, 5 again. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, 
and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. You reverse that, there are some names that will be blotted out who have not remained faithful to God. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. I, because I paid the price, I shed my blood, I became like him. I understood his temptations, I understood his trials, I understood her pain, I understood her anxiety for her children because I became human. I understand and I understand the Father because I am both human and I am divine and no one is more qualified than I to stand between God and humanity. I will confess him before my father and before his angels. There is a judgment going on in heaven. There is a book where people's names are written. When God told Moses that he would blot out the Israelites, he would kill them, Moses says, if you don't show them mercy, blot me out of your book. And the Lord said, he who has sinned against me, he will I blot out of my book. Moses said, if you don't save them, blot me out of your book. In other words, destroy me in hell because I can't allow, you. well, I shouldn't say can't allow, but I can't just watch my people destroyed. Let me die with them. Moses said, blot me out. And God said, I'm not blotting you out. I will blot out those who sinned against me. There's a book in heaven. That book is being examined while you and I sit right now. When that process ends, that's when the cry will be made, Revelation 22, 11, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. Holy, let him be holy still. When that announcement is made, that process is done. Which means many churches mislead members by teaching them when Christ comes, you'll have an opportunity to repent. No. Let's look at Revelation 14, verse 14. Revelation 14, 13. Sorry, 14, 14. In this verse, John the Revelator sees a white cloud. Revelation 14, 14, he sees a white cloud, behold a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man. Now, what is, how does John describe him? Having on his head, what? A golden crown in his hand, what? A sharp sickle. The word sickle appears in the Bible 11 times. About four times in the Old Testament or three, seven or eight in the New and in the New Testament, it occurs about six times in Revelation 14, the chapter we're in now. Wherever you see the word sickle in the Bible, it is used in context of a harvest. Separating the ripe from the green, the ripe from those who never matured. John sees Christ with a crown on his head and a sickle in his hand. He's coming to reap. That's the second coming. Now, Go to Leviticus 16, 25 to 8. Leviticus 16. You see, Christ is both, right now, Christ is a high priest. He's not yet king. He's a priest. Because he's interceding on our behalf, you see. He's priest. Let's see what the priest wears. And he shall put on the linen coat. He shall be, and, and shall be girded with a linen girdle. Or shall have the linen breeches upon his flesh, and shall be girded with the linen girdle, and with the linen mitre shall he be attired. Now the mitre was worn on the head of the priest. The priest's head covering was a mitre, and it was inscribed holiness unto the Lord. That's what God told Moses to make for Aaron from Exodus 28 onward, part of the clothing of the high priest. He wore a mitre on his head. Right now, symbolically, Jesus has that mitre because he's serving as a priest, representing those who put their faith in him. But when John sees him coming on a cloud, he does not have a mitre. He is wearing a crown, which means the work of the priest is done. 
He's coming as a king to conquer his enemies and deliver his people, not as a priest. So those who preach, when Jesus comes, there is an op another opportunity to repent. That's too late. The time to repent, you tell me, is now. All exams, all classes have exams. Life is a class. The judgment is the exam. The source material is the gospel. The teacher, the Holy Spirit representing Christ. The teaching assistants, all universities have teaching assistants. The preachers and the Bible workers. The parents. That exam, and I keep saying it, is proceeding right now. Go to Acts 17. Let me put your mind on additional evidence. Acts 17. Let's read verse 31. Acts 17, verse 31. Because he hath appointed a day in which he will do what? Judge the world. That's future. That in the days of Paul, that judgment had not begun. This is future. Are you with me? Of judgment in, in a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness, that judgment is future. By the way, notice, for he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. Ecclesiastes says, the law is that standard. James says, live as if you'll be judged by the law of liberty, which means clearly the law of liberty is the standard of righteousness by which the judgment will be conducted. Because that righteousness is the very righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's why Romans 8 verse 2 says, Christ came, verse 3, that verse 4, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. That's why Jesus came, one of his missions. As I said, that is happening now. In the days of Paul, it had not yet begun. In the days of the Revelator, many years after Paul, it had not yet begun. Now go to Revelation 14. 6 and 7. Revelation 14, 6 and 7, our subject, all classes of exams. What I'm trying to cram into one message usually takes many nights. Revelation 14, 6. Let me pray first. Father, continue to be with me. I truly, truly ask of you in Jesus' name. Amen. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him. Read the next part for me. For the hour of his judgment is come. So sometime in the past, after long after the days of the new testament but before this modern time god's judgment began you won't get into precise dates god's well i'll give you the date without going into it according to bible prophecy that judgment began october 22 1844 and one day it will end once it ends Mercy no longer pleads. Make a decision for Christ. Make a decision to obey your Savior. Make a decision to receive the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, to enable you to live an upright life. Make a decision while you are alive right now. I'm not trying to be frightening or terrify you i'm simply saying now is the best opportunity to decide to do what is right you may have been in church 20 years 25 30 you were just a church member not a child of god make a decision to start with god all over again and this time by his grace to get it right notice i said by his grace to get it right there is a judgment going on in heaven now. He answering said unto them, The children of this world marry and are given in marriage. But they which shall be accounted worthy, those who will be judged worthy to obtain that world, 
that act of deciding who will be worthy for that world is going on now. And the Spirit of God is busy moving people. Moving people. Noah preached 120 years. The Spirit of God was moving. Only eight living people entered that ark. God said in Genesis 6 verse 3, My spirit shall not always strive with man. There comes a time when God says enough is enough. God is merciful, but we tend to forget that God has suffered because of sin for 6,000 years. We only think of ourselves, ours, we never pause, well seldom pause to think how sin affects God. And he wants to put an end to it. It's ruined his world. It has blighted the universe to some degree. We have murdered jails. You know, I love, I was talking to my pastor. And I was telling him we were discussing national parks and those places. I love to go out and watch the animals, watch the birds, the trees. You know, go to nature. But as beautiful as those national parks are, those wildlife sanctuaries, there is tremendous suffering. <laughs> right now, a gazelle's throat is in the mouth of a lion somewhere in Tanzania, Africa, or Zimbabwe, or someplace. Right now, there's a, a pack of hyenas eating a, 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 a springbok alive. Right now, there's a scorpion stinging somebody. Right now, two dogs are fighting. Right now, two cats are fighting. Right now, a snake is biting someone and killing someone. Why? Because sin has affected the natural world, not just humanity. And God has to watch that. He has to put an end. And this tribunal, this trial, this act of deciding who is worthy, which is going on now, it will cease one day. And when that happens, the door of mercy will be closed. We have a date from the Bible for when it began. We have no date for when it ends. Noah preached and preached and preached. Finally, God closed the door of the ark. Genesis 7, 16, and the Lord shut him in. Let me tell you something. The same closed door that shut Noah in shut the unrighteous out. Noah could not open that door to let anyone in because he was not the one who shut it. The Lord, this is enough. The Lord told Saul through Samuel, because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath rejected thee from being king. And in 1 Samuel 16, 14, and the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. And an evil spirit tormented him, troubled him. The spirit of the Lord left him. Why? Because he rejected the word of God. 1 Samuel 15 verse 23. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee. Listen to me. To reject truth is to reject God regardless of how often you sit in a church. To reject truth is to reject God. Because God is truth. Deuteronomy 32 verse 4. Jesus is truth. John 14 16. The Holy Spirit is truth. 1 John 5 6. To reject truth is to reject the divine family. And one day, God will have to pour out his judgment and his justice. God is a God of love, but everything God does is just. When he punishes, it's an act of love. But God prefers to save. Can you say amen? 2 Peter 3 verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Come to repentance tonight. Tell God in your heart, Father, I'm making a decision to accept Christ. Or, Father, I'm choosing to start all over because my past life has been like this, a flat line, no growth, no growth, no growth, no growth, no growth. I was preaching somewhere. I made an appeal. 50 people came for baptism and rebaptism, And as I met with them, a pastor met with me and told his testimony. He said in the middle of his ministry, he went to the conference president and said, I'd like to be rebaptized." The president said, what? 
What have you done? He said, I've done nothing catastrophic, but I need to be rebaptized. The president said, why? He said, I have not grown spiritually at all. I've managed the church. The tithe is fine. Membership is fine. But I have gone like this. No growth at all. I need to start all over with my God. The president said, well, we'll baptize you at night. He said, no, 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 no. <laughs> baptize me in front of my church because there are members in the same condition who need to start all over with God. And he was rebaptized. I was speaking somewhere in some country which will remain unnamed. The pastor's wife got rebaptized along with his eldest son. I was in another church preaching. The assistant pastor got rebaptized. He realized his life really was nothing more than a flat line. He got rebaptized. There is room in the gospel for those who make a decision to start all over with God and this time by the Spirit of God get it right make a decision my friends make that choice father I'm giving my life to Christ father I want to start again through rebaptism evangelism page 375 paragraph 2 when a soul is truly reconverted let that soul be rebaptized in Acts chapter 19 verse 1 to 7 Paul met 12 disciples who had been baptized by John the Baptist but they had never heard of the Holy Ghost Paul said what when Paul preached the Holy Ghost to them you cannot say I've never heard of the Holy Ghost this is vital information all 12 were rebaptized by Paul the Bible has baptism the Bible has rebaptism. There's a decision card, fill it out. Wherever you are watching online, fill out that card, piece of paper in your hand, on the screen, make a decision. There is a judgment going on above right now. Determining who will be worthy to obtain that world. Anyone in Christ is safe. It's nothing to scare you. Anyone in Christ is safe. Are you in Christ or are you just in church? How many of you say, Father, I recommit my life to you. Let Jesus represent me in that judgment. Can I see your right hand? I recommit my life to you. Stand up with me. Let's pray. Those of you online, make that choice. Give that life to Christ or make a decision to start all over again through baptism. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the warning. Your warnings are expressions of love, not threat. The most popular verse in the Bible has a warning day, God. It says, for God so loved the world, that's nice, that he gave his only begotten son, that's nice, that whosoever believeth, that's nice, should not perish. Perishing is the frightening part. It contains the threat of death for those who do not believe. But that threat, day, God, is an expression of love because some people will only come in the when they are facing a threat. Dear God, let your spirit work over time if there's such a thing. To move those who need to make decisions, to make those choices now, giving the life to Christ, starting again through rebaptism, or being baptized for the first time to live an obedient life through the power of the Spirit of God. Dear Father, hear this humble prayer. Let lives be changed right now, I pray. In Jesus' name, let God's people say, Amen and Amen. God bless you, my beloved brothers and sisters, and online, God bless you. Come back tomorrow, if possible, try to bring someone with you.